Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. Again, my wife Nancy's here with me and my mom, Ruth. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. This morning when I was eating breakfast, I looked at my phone, looked at my messages and saw a note from Karen Jordan. Hi, Karen. There is a huge cyclone uh, bearing down on India and it's the largest they've ever seen in history. So in this time of pandemic, when everybody is already hunkered down in their homes, it's gonna create a huge problem. So we're gonna pray for India today and the people who are undergoing this cyclone. And I also heard that there's massive flooding, I think in Michigan, uh, somewhere in the Midwest. And we still have all of our other problems in the world going on, both as a nation and, and as states, but also in our own lives. It's not just this pandemic. We have other difficulties and strains in our life. So we have much to pray for. So let's begin with prayer. Father, I just want to thank you for this day and I thank you for everyone gathered now and those who will yet be watching on YouTube later on, either today or in the coming days and, and weeks and even months. Father, I know that you hear us. I thank you for these words in 1 John 5 verses 14 and 15 that say this is the confidence which we have before you that if we ask anything according to your will you hear us and if we know that you hear us in whatever we ask we know that we have the re requests which we have asked for, for from you such confidence that we have before you if we ask anything according to your will Father, I don't always understand what your will is. Some people are very, very certain of what your will is and declare that will. I'm not always so sure because I'm not God. And just as this smoke and vapor is billowing about, I feel like we're in the midst of smoke and vapor in our lives. It's so hard to see clearly in these days. It's so hard to have a clear perspective. Even this morning in reading a post from a group I belong to, a minister's group, I just see another moral decline in our society that's fast approaching. And Father, sometimes I'm, I'm a loss for words. On the one hand, we want God bless America. We want God to bless America. On the other hand, we don't want anything to do with you. So many people have believed, come to believe that you don't even exist. And then even in the midst of this pandemic, there is so much vapor and smoke and confusion. Misinformation and disinformation. Rumors. Father, we need clarity of sight. We need clarity of understanding. We need spiritual discernment, Lord. Not from our own thinking, not from the thinking of our flesh, but from the mind of Christ. So, Father, this morning I just pray that you would give us clarity in our thinking, clarity in our discernment, that you would gift us with uh, deep discernment. And Father, I, I think about India today and this enormous cyclone that's bearing down on them. The potential for enormous loss of life, the spread of COVID-19 in the midst of the aftermath. Father, we ask that you would quiet the storm that even now you would speak peace, be still to the storm. And in our own lives, as we face 
uncertainty about where this pandemic is going to go, whether it's going to get worse again or better, better as time goes on. I pray that you would speak peace into this storm. And having made those requests, Lord, we know that nothing happens outside of your permissive will. You're allowing this pandemic, even you're allowing this cyclone. And sometimes we have no understanding of why you allow things to happen in our lives, both individually but globally in our world. And yet we know that you are for us, that you love this world to the extent that you gave up your son to die not on just on the behalf of the elect or on Christ, on behalf of Christians, but you died for the entire world, giving out that offer that whoever believes in you should not perish but have eternal life, that whoever believes in Jesus And so again, we come to those words that if we ask anything according to your will. So Father, the things that we know are your will are some of the prayers in the New Testament. And so from Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 12, I pray the prayer of Paul. May we be filled with the knowledge of your will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Again, Lord, may, may we be filled with the knowledge of your will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that we may walk in a manner worthy of you, our Lord, to please you in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of you, strengthened with all, all power according to your glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience joyously giving thanks to you, the Father, who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Again, Lord, may we be filled with the knowledge of your will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Father, I just uh, thank you for today. I thank you for those gathered. I thank you for those who are yet to listen. I thank you for the psalm before us, Again, I pray your garden prayer and the, and the prayer from the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Father, our request is take this cup from us. Take this cup from India. Yet not as we will, Lord. Your will be done. Your will be done. Amen. Again, welcome. It's nice to have you here this morning. Here we have kind of cloudy gray weather. It's supposed to start raining tonight and then rain good tomorrow. I sometimes enjoy the rain. I enjoy the sun, sunshine too. Last night, Nancy and I were out walking in the neighborhood and the sun was getting near the horizon as it was preparing to make its descent and, and uh, And the sun, sunset was almost upon us. And that sunlight was streaming across and hitting all the blades of grass next to the food bank here. And the breeze was making the leaves dance in the trees. And birds were flying all over the place. What a wonder it is to be alive. I look around us and we have so much to be thankful for. 
So later, after we get done today, just stop before you even move. Stop and look around your room, the room where you're in, and count the things that you can be thankful for, that you've been blessed with. It tends to put a positive spin on our thoughts. Today we come to Psalm 28. It's again a Psalm of David. It's actually the third in a trilogy. 26, 27, and 28 are all linked. 28 has language linked to 27, and 27 has language linked to 26. And so it's this trilogy of laments, if you will, in which David asks for God to intervene because he's in great danger. He's faced with an enemy who's out to take his life, a deceiving enemy, a lying enemy, an enemy that's saying falsehood about David. And so this is the third in that trilogy. Let's read Psalm 28. To you, O Lord, I call my rock. Do not be deaf to me. For if you are silent to me, I will be like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to you for help. When I lift my hands toward your holy sanctuary. Do not drag me away with the wicked and with those who work iniquity, who speak peace with their neighbors while evil is in their hearts. Requit them according to their work and according to the evil of their practices. Re requite them? Is it requit or requite? requite? Requite them according to the deeds of their hands. Thank you, Grandma. Requite them according to the deeds of their hands. Repay them their recompense. Because they do not regard the works of the Lord, nor the deeds of his hands, he will tear them down and not build them up. Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplication. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart exalts, and with my song I shall thank him. The Lord is their strength. And he is a saving defense to his anointed. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd also and carry them forever. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd also and carry them forever. So in this psalm again we have uh, distinct structure to the poetry, and I'll show you it. It's three chiastic structures, if you will, or it's three mi mirrored structures. The first two are almost perfect mirrors. The third one, David, for some reason at the end, departs from the mirrored, mirrored structure. But again, they did this kind of, of poetry because in oral cultures, when you're listening to poetry, you heard the idea going in, you got to that center idea, and then you heard the idea going back out in reverse. And so let's work through this together. I'm going to first work through straight through and then point out the parallel structures. To you, O Lord, I call. And so, again, David is calling to the Lord, L-O-R-D, in capital letters, and in so many versions means that it's the name Yahweh, that holy name of God that the Israelites and the Hebrew people chose not to defame by reading the word for Lord when they came to this word in, in their Bibles, in, in the uh, Hebrew scriptures. And so here they would read, to you, O Lord, instead of to you, O Yahweh, even, the word is, even though the word is Yahweh. Even the Greek uh, Septuagint picked this up and read the word Kyrios, which is Greek for Lord, to you, O Lord, I call. And then we know from the New Testament that Jesus repeatedly said, I am, before Abraham was born, I am. 
And so here again you have, to you, O Jesus, I call. To you, to you, O Yahweh, I call in the mystery of the Trinity. I think that for David, of course, he didn't know much about uh, Jesus at all, but he did know Yahweh. To you, O Lord, I call. My rock, do not be deaf to me. And so he's calling out to God, reminding God that he is his rock, he is his firm place, he is his fortress. The idea is a strong rock that you can stand upon above the battle, or even a rock can refer to a fortress. Even in these times, in this pandemic, God is our rock. He is a rock on which we stand. No shifting sands in Jesus. Do not be deaf to me. For if you are silent to me, I will become like those who go down to the pit. Have you ever had times in your life when you felt like heaven was steeled over? That God was silent? Like he had turned his face away? As if he was no longer listening to your prayers? In my life, when I've had those times, the first place I go is, what did I do wrong? He must be angry at me. He must be upset with me. And I've grown, under the, grown up under this vapor, under this cloud of wondering if God is angry with me, if he's upset with me. Because my sin was always and still is always before me. But David says, to you, O Lord, I call. My rock, do not be deaf to me. Please hear me. For if you are silent to me, I will become like those who go down to the pit. This is a Hebrew idiom for those who die. It's the pit was a cistern, a deep well, a cistern, but it became a idiom or a picture of what it was like to die, to go down into a dark water cistern way down. And so David is asking that, or actually telling God, if you don't show up, if you don't start listening to my prayers, I'm going to end up dying. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to you for help. He's begging Yahweh to hear him. I've been in such times in my life. When I was 12 years old, as many of you know, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. And for three years, every night, I prayed so fervently, Lord, please heal her. And my mother had great faith. She went to healing conferences with Catherine Coleman back in those days. Ministers would come by with their wives and pray for her, lay hands on her, anoint her with oil. She believed for three years that God was going to heal her until two years or two weeks before her death. And then she brought my sister and I into her room. My, my father woke us up at 6 a.m., And we sat on her the little cot on which my dad slept in her room. She was in a hospital bed. And she motioned us over to come by her bed. And she said, children, she called us children even though we were older. Children, the Lord isn't going to heal me. He's calling me home. Do not be deaf to me. For if you are silent to me, I will become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my supplication when I cry to you for help. Sometimes heaven is silent. Sometimes heaven is steeled over. The ambulance came and we uh, drove with George Daly, following the ambulance through all the red lights, high speed to the hospital. And two weeks later, the Lord called my mother home.
prayers unanswered. Those cries for help. Seemingly unheard. The irony of those days in my life is that very pain, that very grief, drew me into rebellion or propelled me into rebellion. It was my choices. And in those days of wild living and drugs and alcohol and perversity, I was shaking my fist at heaven for being silent. But the great irony for me is because of those days, both because of the hardship and, and cry of, of my heart during the days of my mother's dying and then my subsequent rebellion and that head injury I had, God revealed to me the depth of his grace and the depth of his immeasurable, unfathomable, boundless, even a new word I learned, Ill illimitable, I don't even know if I pronounced it right. This love without limit. So what I've learned is in these hard times, in David's life, in your life and in my life, when everything seems to be falling apart, when our health seems to be falling apart or is falling apart, our finances are falling apart, we've lost jobs, our relationships are on the rocks, they are shattering. Nothing is wasted in God's economy. Nothing is ever wasted. What Satan and his evil cohorts plan for us, God always turns into blessing in our lives. Now let's look at the parallelism. To you, O Lord, I call. We jump down to when I lift up my hands towards your holy sanctuary. That would have been the tent of in which David had placed the Ark of the Covenant. And that word, the holy sanctuary, is literally referring to the part of that tent which held the Holy of Holies, or the Ark of the Covenant. So when he says, I lift my hands towards your holy sanctuary, it's when you lift your hands like this, it's a receptive stance. And I would say they were lifted like this. It's a receptive stance to say, Lord, I need you. Whatever you have for me, I'm willing to receive it. And it was towards his Holy of Holies, which meant God's very presence was made known at the very point where the Ark of the Covenant was located. So to you, O Lord, I call, I lift up my hands towards your presence. My rock, do not be deaf to me. And then we skip down to the same level when I cry to you for help. So, do not be deaf to me is a negative statement. I cry to you for help is a positive statement. For if you are silent to me, and the counterpart down below, hear the voice of my supplications. Again, the silence is the negative part. The request is in the midst of that silence. Hear the voice of my supplications. And then that middle line, they're called strophes. That middle strophe says, I will become like those who go down to the pit. So the center idea in this psalm, in this section of the psalm is, God, if you keep on being silent, I'm going to be I'm going to end up dead. I'm going to go down to the grave, to the pit where no one can praise you from the pit. And then we move on in the psalm and it says, "Do not drag me away with the wicked and with those who work iniquity." 
so these are the men, most likely sol soldiers or people who are out to get David, who have spread disinformation and lies about him, who speak peace with their neighbors while evil is in their hearts. So they're double-minded, they're two-faced people, people who wear masks. With all the people around them, they look like men and maybe women of peace. But actually, in their hearts, which in Hebrew language meant the mind, the thoughts, more so than the emotions. While evil is in their hearts, meaning they're speaking peace, they're being kind to all the neighbors, they're being kind to David, supposedly on the out, out, outward appearance, but on the inside, they're planning evil for him. Some people try to say that maybe this was Absalom, when Absalom turned against David and turned much of Israel against him. But given David's response to Ab Absalom's death and his he didn't want Absalom ever killed. So when he says, requite them according to their work and according to their evil practices, it would be very unlikely for David to be praying that, given what we know about him, that he'd be praying that for Absalom. So really, we don't know who the enemies are. Requite them according to their work and according to the evil of their practices. Repay them. Let them have the full consequences of what their work is and these evil practices. Requite them according to the deeds of their hands. Repay them their recompense. Repay them their wages. Because they do not regard the works of the Lord nor the deeds of his hand. Ironically, that word works there because they do not regard the works of the Lord. It has different shades of meaning. One of the shades of meaning is because they do not regard the wages of the Lord. And that has that sense of judgment in it. When we don't regard the possibility of the wages from the Lord, which we know for the wages of sin is death. And so much of our world today has forgotten that there are wages to what we do. There are consequences. We earn the consequences of our bad behavior. And it's just as true for Christians. Sometimes he protects us. But there's no guarantee in our Christian life that he will protect us from the consequences of our sin. Because they do not regard the works of the Lord, nor the deeds of his hands. Also, that can mean they don't look around them at the works of the Lord, the stars, the moon, the galaxies, the planets, the wonder of a cedar forest, the cedars of Lebanon, the wonder of the beauty of the Mediterranean Sea, or the Sea of Galilee at sunrise, or the hot sweltering desert of the Dead Sea or the magnificence of the city of Jerusalem built on Mount Moriah. When we ignore the works of his hands all around us, which speak out his glory, even last night when I saw that sunlight streaming through all that grass and it was all like almost lit up neon, who created the light? Who created that grass to reflect that light in such beauty in that wonderful grass green. And so even the grass praises God. The leaves bounce with light bouncing off their leaves and dancing in the breeze, all declaring the praise of God. The birds with their bird song, and as I've said before, really their God song because God gave each bird their song all of creation around us, all of creation around us singing his glory. And when we don't regard those works of the Lord's hands, nor the deeds of his hands, he will tear them down and not build them up. 
That word tearing down is the, is the word used for destroying buildings. I remember watching their church being torn down here. And we had served, that was in 2009, so we had served 13 years here when that building was torn down, my wife and I. And we were, our whole congregation was gathered around on different sides of the building. R.W. Ryan came and we were standing right under the eaves of our house here watching. And that first direct hit of the excav excavator hitting the side of the building where the church office used to be in the stairwell and that corner of the building just crumpled. And Nancy and I burst out sobbing. It was like, oh, this building in which so much life had happened. And then slowly that excavator tore down the entire building until all that was left was the front of the building. And then he grabbed it and he pulls on it, tries to pull it, doesn't quite go. He gets a better grip on it grabs it, and the whole front of the building falls, literally on top of the excavator, and he was in a cage, of course. He will tear de them down, not build them up. So David is saying, again, to his enemies, those who disregard both the wages of our sin, but also all around us, the beauty of creation speaking out his glory, that he is real, that he is powerful. He will end up tearing them down and not build them up. Now let's look at the parallel, parallelism in this. Do not drag me away with the wicked and with those who work iniquity. David is saying this, if you keep silent, I'm going to go down right with all these wicked people. I, my life is going to look no different than them, and I'm going to end up in the pit just like they're going to end up in the pit. And then its counterpart, he will tear them down and not build them up. Do not drag me away with the wicked. He will tear them down. Notice, do not drag me away. God is the one doing the dragging. God is the one doing the tearing down. Have you ever felt like that in your life, that God is suddenly out to get you? And then the second pair, who speak peace with their neighbors, requite them according to the deeds of, your hand, of their hands, requite them or repay them their recompense. So on the outside, they're speaking peace with their neighbors. They're wearing that mask. And David says, don't pay attention to those masks. Requite them, repay them according to these of their hands. It doesn't matter how they appear. What matters is what they are actually doing. Repay them their recompense. Repay them their wages. What they have coming. And then again, we move further in. While evil is in their hearts, so while evil is in their minds, and then down two lines, and according to the evil of their practices. So on the one hand, we have the evil in their hearts and their minds, and then we have the actual doing of the evil. It always, all evil, all sin, all wrongdoing always starts in our thought life before it comes out as action. Sometimes that is a pretty short period of time. But there's this parallel between what we do with our minds and what we do with our behavior. And they are linked. The old saying, garbage in, garbage out. And then last we get to the middle of it and requite them according to their work. So these enemies, repay them. Give them what they deserve. Requite them. According to their work, and their work was evil, their work was bad. Their work was full of sin and false appearance and evil motivation. So you see these two stanzas and very much talking about the enemy. And the two center points are, 
if you don't hear me, I'm going to go down to the pit. And secondly, these enemies who are trying to take my life, requite them according to their work, repay them according to their work. So I, I think about this from the New Testament point of view, and we've, we've gone here in, in twice before, just with both Psalm 26 and 27. But these verses make me nervous because of his desire to have his enemies brought to destruction. I know if you're in the military, these words fit very well, and I'm not discounting that in any way. There's a just place for these words still in our, in our world. And yet I can't help of, but think of how things changed, that progressive revelation, how more light was given to us. I think of Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 5, verses 44. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I think most times we don't even try to pray for our enemies, and we certainly don't love them. And the only way I know how to do that is by leaning in close to the one who loves them, who gave up his life for them, to have him so full in me that I am full of his love for even my enemies. And then we need to pray for those who persecute us. We need to pray for our enemies. Who are the people that you most disdainfully speak of? Maybe it's politicians. Maybe it's a, a co-worker or a boss or a relative. Or maybe it's your pastor, me. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Or again in Romans 12, 14, Paul, remembering these words of Jesus, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. We're so quick to curse people. We are so quick to condemn and complain and denigrate. And get this, those first words in Matthew 5, they're still spoken to people under the law by Jesus. Jesus was born under the law to redeem those from under the law, and he redeemed them at the cross. So we know that the new covenant begins at the cross, not later, or not earlier. And so Jesus is speaking to Hebrew people, to Pharisees, to the disciples, all still living under the law. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you not praying for destruction or judgment. I, I don't think it's wrong to seek justice. Please don't hear me that, hear that. And I think there are times when we need to pray for justice. When there is a husband abusing his wife physically and sexually and emotionally, we need to pray for justice and we need to seek justice. Yet at the same time, we can pray for those people Pray that God would fill us with love for them. We pray for our enemies. And I think about the passage we've been looking at in 2 Corinthians over the last couple weeks on Sundays. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. For the love of Christ controls us. Not the law, not the rules of our own making, not our own flesh, not our, not our self-discipline, not our strength, not our ability, not our merits, but the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, and this is why the love of Christ controls us, that one died for all, and therefore all died. Do you hear that? Jesus died for all. From Adam and Eve to the last person born before the destruction and before the great day of the Lord. That one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all so that they who live, meaning those who have come to faith in him, that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. So we no longer live for ourselves. When you become a Christian, you don't automatically move into living for everybody else. It's, it's a journey. I'm still on it. I still struggle with selfishness, and I suspect so do you. 
And then I love this, therefore. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. And it's derived from the one died for all, and therefore all died. So I've mentioned that make, making the sign of the cross is drawing a, a cross between me and, and you, whoever that person is out there. And so we ne no longer recognize any, anyone from the flesh, meaning a human vantage point, even from our own thinking and our own wisdom. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we no longer know him in this way. Yet now we know him in this way no longer. What it's getting at is we look at everybody as those for whom Christ died. Those for whom Christ gave up his life. For tho those for whom Christ loved us so much that he would spill his blood and give up his spirit that we might live. Oh, how he loves us. But having said that, oh, how he loves them. Oh, how he loves the world. I think of some people in my own life who cruelly abuse people I love. And my flesh wants vengeance. My flesh wants to hurt. But knowing how much God has forgiven me for, knowing how he has graced me because of the cross, then I'm able to look at those people and say, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. Do whatever it takes to bring them to their senses so that they might come to know your grace, the power of your grace, the transforming power of your Holy Spirit. So, what I'm getting at is, really in this life, we don't have human enemies. They may appear to be our enemies, and they sure may treat us as their enemies. But Christ died for all, therefore all died. That isn't universalism, they still have to receive the gift. And so I think, again, who is our real enemy? And we saw this, I think, last time from Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. It never says, be, finally, be strong in your own strength or in your own ability or, or your own effort, your own wisdom. Finally, be strong in the Lord. And I think, again, we're capitalizing on that Jewish and Roman understanding of the Lord as God. And in the strength of his might, we're talking about Jesus here. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the ske schemes of the devil. That word is the word I think we get methodology for. Uh, it, it means a set plan of attack that we might stand firm against the battle plans of the enemy. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Here it goes again, that same idea. We don't look at people after the flesh any longer. For Christ. For one died for all, therefore all died. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in, in the heavenly places. That's our real enemy, Satan and his demonic hosts, and the hierarchy of their army. In this planned assault, in this planned battle, against our lives and against every human being's life. In 1 John it says the whole world is under the power of the evil one, but we are children of God. I think we have to remember our citizenship. Our citizenship is not of this world. Jesus' kingdom, he said, was not of this world. Our citizenship, our true citizenship, is of, a, is of a world yet to come. A world that we are yet to be introduced to. But while we're here in this world, we are in a battle. 
We are in a spiritual battle against spiritual forces of wickedness. And so those prayers of David in Psalm 28 fit perfectly when we pray about this true enemy. Re requite them for their works. Repay them with their recompense. Tear them down. Bring them to nothing. Destroy them. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Again, it's a defensive stance. And we need to be taking up that armor before that day comes. You need to be well prepared in advance. And as we saw last time, you can go back and listen to, I think it was Psalm 27, where Jesus is our armor. So that's kind of the New Covenant look at David's call to destroy his enemies. And now we there's a turn in this psalm. We've gone through Psalm 1, Psalm 28, verses 1 through 5, and then 6 through 9 becomes another strophe, another chiastic structure, if you will. And yet it's not mirrored. You can see there's this kind of a weird three lines at the bottom. It's as if he got through the structure and then he got, oh, by the way, I got to add this on. So let's read through this really quickly. Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplication. So those first five verses, he's crying out. Heaven is steeled over. God is deaf to me. I'm not being heard at all. And now the, he's turned a corner. And we don't know if this is later in time or if he's realized once again that Jesus is his rock, that Yahweh is his rock. Blessed be the Lord, Yahweh, because he has heard the voice of my supplication. When you finish your requests, do you bless the Lord because you know he's heard you? The Lord is my strength and my shield. David turns to looking to himself and remembering, in a sense he's remembering all those times when the Lord has been in the past, his strength and his shield. Hebrew people, as I've said many times, never found hope by looking to the future. They always found hope by looking to the past and remembering God's faithfulness in, in the path. The Lord is my strength. He was my strength back then. He is my strength and my shield now. It seems during the days of my mother's death and in, in days of her dying, the Lord had steeled heaven over. But then nevertheless, all through those days, he was my strength. In the days of my wild living, he was my shield and my strength. And when he first and when he finally drew me home, allowing that serious head injury to bring me to my senses, he has been my strength and my shield all throughout my life. David says, My heart trusts in him and I am helped. Remembering that Yahweh is his strength and his shield. It's covenant language, that he is in covenant with, with Yahweh. Jesus isn't going to turn his back on us in the new covenant. My heart trusts in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart exults. And with my song, I shall thank him. And so David responds, by praising God in song. And then he takes a turn here. The Lord is their strength. Now as king, he's not only thinking of his own life, but he's thinking of the lives of his people. Yahweh is their strength, and he is a saving defense to his anointed. Who is his anointed? He's speaking third person here. His anointed is the king. The anointed is the king, and so it's speaking of, of David himself as king. He is a saving defense to his anointed, Save your people and bless your inheritance. So in the same way that Yahweh saves the king, he also saves the people of Israel. And bless your inheritance. That's that wonderful idea that the, the people of Israel, the Hebrew people, are God's inheritance. And in the same way in the New Covenant we read, 
dear God, the God, or is that right? Yeah, dear God, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may you give to us a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of you. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that we may know what is the hope of your calling, what is the riches of your of the glory of your inheritance in the saints, what is the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints. And so the saints, you and I, as those who have given our life to Christ, and those who have been persuaded to believe, we are God's inheritance, just as Israel is his inheritance. Be their shepherd also, now drawing on Psalm 23, and the whole imagery of the good shepherd of Jesus is that good shepherd, and carry them forever. That word carry is the word for picking up a little child and throwing him on your shoulder. But here, they love to mix metaphors in Hebrew culture, these pictorial, this pictorial thinking that they did. So be Israel, Israel's shepherd also and carry them like a little lamb on your shoulder forever. Uh, we get into this whole debate about replacement theology versus Israel is one, one track and the church is another track. I read scripture. I don't follow the isms of this world. And what I find is that Gentiles have been grafted into one new man. Read Ephesians 2. He has torn down the dividing wall and made the two into one new man. We've been grafted in. And so this applies to us as well. Save your people and bless your inheritance. We are the Lord's inheritance. Be our shepherds also and carry us like a little lamb on your shoulders, not just throughout our lives, but forever, vouchsafing that eternal life to us. So now let's look at the, the contrast, or the, the parallel parallelism very quickly. Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplication, and he is a saving defense to his anointed. And so on the, the first part, bless the Lord because he's heard my supplication and that answered prayer is he's a saving defense to his king. He preserved his life in the midst of this tragedy, whether it was yet to come or if it had already happened. The Lord is my strength and my shield. And down below, below the Lord is their strength. And so again, we, we find out that God is my strength, but he's also the church's strength. He's also the Hebrew people's strength. And I would even say that because one died for all and all died, he is the world's strength. If they would but turn to him and call out to him. And then the next parallelism is my heart trusts in, trusts in him and I am helped. And with my song, I shall thank him. So on the one heart, on the one side, my heart trusts in him and I am helped. And as a response to that, with my song, I shall thank him. And then that center line, line, therefore, my heart exults. We were up at uh, Paradise on Mount Rainier when I was in junior high. We loved to go up there. My dad loved to take us up to, to Paradise on Mount Rainier. We'd go hiking around the, the hillside there or the mountainside there. And there was that round visitation or visitor center there. And there was little alcoves all around the outside the building with stone kind of dividers that were part of the building. And in each of those alcoves were picnic tables. So we were walking around. The, us kids were playing tag outside. And we came across a group of uh, Jewish people or Israelites. And they'd been drinking a little wine, so they were full of joy. And they locked arms, man, woman, man, woman, man, woman, all around. There was about eight to 12 of them, probably 12 of them. And they started just singing and dancing with their feet going out in the circle. And it was pure hilarity, pure exaltation, pure joy. And that's catching this. Therefore, my heart exults. We, we, we Protestants and we, we uh, Scandinavian people, if you're Scandinavian or, or we, you can just say Protestants, we, we praise the Lord with, with gladsome mind, right? We praise the Lord with gladsome mind. No, Hebrew people knew how to belt it out, how to shout it out, how to... You just want to jump up and down and, and shout. And
when I look at what God has done in my life, how he has rescued me, how he has delivered me from grief and sin and debauchery and alcoholism and a whole host of other sins and some he's still working on. Therefore, my heart exalts. I think of the verse that says, if God is for us, then who can be against us? If God is for you, then who can be against you? No one. So out of this psalm, you see those three things. Don't let me go down to the pit. Repay my enemies. And my heart exalts. And lastly, there's these two lines thrown on. Save your people and bless your inheritance. It's like he remembers that he's praying for himself and then suddenly as king he remembers, no, I have a people that I'm serving too. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd also and carry them forever. I had a dear friend at the church, Gail Mills, and she was married to Don Mills. Don was 96 at the time. And she had significant heart trouble and I think she kind of had this idea that she wasn't going to be around too long. So she got Don moved into a local, um, what is it called, an assisted living place and she moved in with him. And so after they were settled in I went over to visit Don and Gail. I had spent hours and hours with them. Dear blessed friends. And Gail had gotten some bad news about her heart. She was having to ha go in for uh, bypass surgery, or was it heart valve replacement? I don't remember. But I went over and visited and listened, and and then I prayed. And I don't know. I, I had never done this in my ministry before. It had to be the Holy Spirit. He had me pray Psalm twenty three. putting Gail as the object of the psalm. Lord, I thank you that you are Gail's shepherd. She shall not want. It had to be the Holy Spirit, because somewhere in the middle of that psalm, there was an epiphany. And she, she exclaimed out, I understand, I get it. And I saw such peace come over her life. An uncommon, uncanny sense of peace that came over her life. I just visited her in the morning at, in the hospital after she had her surgery. She wasn't doing well. She was back here at Harrison. And I had gone home because it looked like it might be uh, many hours. And the whole family was gathered around. And as soon as I got home, I got the call, come back, Gail is dying. So I rushed back and I came into the room. And she was still cognizant. She gently smiled. And I can't explain it. She had such peace in her life. Never seen it in my life before, someone dying with such a per pervasive peace. It's because she had understood, she had come to understand that Yahweh, that Jesus, is our shepherd. He takes care of everything. And he will carry us forever. He will carry you forever. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me today. I'm glad to be done with that trilogy. It's not always the easiest, these Hebrew scripture psalms in which David rails against his enemies. Let Jesus be your good shepherd even these days. Read through Psalm 23. Pray this prayer against our real enemy. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you for the truth in your word for the beauty of Hebrew poetry. 
I thank you for these words in John 16, 24 that say, Until now you have asked nothing for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be full. There are so many things we could ask for. But Father, I know what's on your heart. You don't want anyone to perish. So our request is you will do whatever it takes in this world to bring a great throng of people to you, to know you, to find eternal life in you. We pray that you would do whatever it takes. Thank you for being our good shepherd. Thank you that we shall not be in want. Thank you that goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life and that we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Well, that concludes our reading of the psalm for today and the meditation and our prayer. I won't be back tomorrow. I have a pastor's meeting a pastor's cl cluster in which I'm actually the, I lead it or actually just organize it and so on. But so I won't be back on Friday either because we're starting up our Thursday night Bible study at 7 p.m. If you would like to participate, either email me, call me, or uh, message me on Facebook and let me know that you want to participate. Uh, if you're from outside of our church, if you're within our church, you have the information on the our church's private page. But I'm looking forward to starting that Bible study. And then this Sunday, we're going to be starting back or returning to the book of John. And I'm really excited about returning to that in-depth look at the book of the Gospel of John each Sunday. And now our blessing is a conclusion to, to our psalm today. Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplication. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart exults, and with my song I shall thank him. The Lord is their strength, and he is a saving defense to his anointed. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd also, and carry them forever. And Lord, be our shepherd also and carry us forever. Amen.